not to talk about myself, but just to give you context from where I come from, I'll give you a brief little summation of my personal story and journey. <coughs> my great great uncle, his name was R.D. Taylor, and he was a missionary Baptist minister in the southern part of Alabama and right down below Alabama in the panhandle of Florida, West Florida. I'm a pastor of Baptist congregations in that part of the world. About 1909, he had a mystical conversion. And that tradition, the tradition I grew up as a child, is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't like to get hung up on language. Uh, maybe what John Wesley talked about the warming of his heart. But something experiential happened to R.E. Taylor. <coughs> and it transformed him to the place that he could not stop talking about it. And of course that did not set well with the brothers and sisters of his tradition. I'm very blessed I had his, his personal diary. And uh, a couple of his churches were burned down. Um, some of the more poor farm communities where he moved around and had, had uh, congregations like the oh, Jewish Arbors uh, were burnt down and destroyed. And ultimately, he was totally um, cast out of that tradition. He continued his ministry and built what would be the very first now a new kind of, of tradition, the first Pentecostal churches in Lower Alabama and West Florida. In 1914, the, uh, a new denomination was formed called the Assemblies of God, which I think now might be the largest Pentecostal denomination in the world. I'm not sure of that for sure, but uh, I think that's the case. Um, so once that tradition started in, in 1914, he entered that organization, our denomination. A generation up from that, my uh, grandparents, my grandfather and grandmother White, um, became Assembly of God ministers. And one thing that that tradition often does not get credit for mm -hmm. is it really is, I think, first tradition to honor and respect the ministry of women. Um, my grandmother, I, I remember so well, I spent time with them stay in their home, and they co-pastored. My grandfather was more uh, introverted and quiet than a teacher, and so he would preach and lead the Sunday morning worship service. And um, Sunday night church was always more camp meeting in style and <coughs> much more exuberant. And so my grandmother would lead Sunday night. She was fully credentialed and uh, a very fiery Pentecostal preacher. Uh, move up a generation from that. My, uh, as Dan said, my father was a very, very successful Assembly of God minister of a very large, I guess what you might consider a mega church, um, and grew up in that home. So you can imagine, I'm now fourth generation that um, I felt that I had no choice but to join the family business. <laughs> and um, I, I, as a very young man, was ordained in the Assemblies of God. But I was blessed to have a family that, as Dan's Southern Baptist father, that, that uh, did not hold us kids in a box, but encouraged us to dream and to experience and to live. And so even as a young Assembly of God minister, I tried to do that, but be a part of the tradition that we were raised in. And in 1988, um, Kind of a similar thing happened to me that happened to R.E. Taylor. I was asked to leave. Nothing was burned down. Uh, <laughs> at least that I know of. 
uh, it's not charged with anything or, or anything like that. It was strictly that I guess I just did not fit the mold. And uh, I um, did what I was asked to do. I left. And to be honest, I was devastated because um, four generations at this point, you know, I grew up with these people's kids. I stayed in their homes. Um, these were my, you know, uncles and aunts, uh, adopted uncles and aunts, and um, I knew nothing else. And um, I was devastated. I did not see it coming. <coughs> Literally, they walk in my office. And I had no premonition or preconceived idea that my whole life was about to be turned upside down. Mm -hmm. Two little children. Um, it was uh, devastating, to, to, to be honest, just because of the sheer shock. So I really didn't do anything for quite a while, but uh, as a young person, my ministry was around and with young people, and primarily young adults at that time. So a lot of them continue to just have relationship with. Um, of course, I was criticized for that. Maybe that was not appropriate. Maybe that was not the right thing to do. But uh, I did. And that group of young adults, in a sense, became an organized fellowship that um, just supported each other. And... and 1989, that very loose, unaligned fellowship of friends started discussions with the Diocese of Georgia. And in 1990, 222 people were confirmed and received in one service by, by uh, five bishops. Uh, we became an unorganized mission of the Diocese of Georgia. Shortly after that, an organized mission. Of the <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a little while later, a parish of the Diocese of Georgia, but we're still not very organized. <laughs> I was ordained a priest in 1991, which is 19 years ago. Our parish has um, been blessed to have a lot of freedom given to us by our bishops. I guess our unusual history, in a sense, gave them courage that, you know, we could have a little bit of rope if we needed it, and we're thankful for that. But we've tried our best to be faithful to the church of the diocese. Um, over the last 19 years, 11 people have been ordained. That's 10 priests and one deacon. Uh, I don't say that to boast, but I am very, very proud of that. And uh, two of those folk um, that were sponsored by our parish, my brother Michael White, who's rector in Savannah, Georgia, um, but his wife Helen White was a part of this group. And so some of you may know my sister-in-law, my sister-in-law Helen 